Well, good morning. It's good to see everyone here. Thanks for coming out. Um, my name is uh, Clarence Lang, um, professor and chair of African and African American studies, and I've been given the distinct honor of um, moderating uh, a conversation this morning with Dr. Robin D.G. Kelly, who's been visiting with us and who, if you were able to attend his talk last night, you will uh, agree is, is definitely an important scholar raising important, important issues. Um, um, Dr. Kelly is, uh, I'll keep the introduction brief, he's okay. Distinguished Professor and Gary B. Nash Endowed Chair in U.S. History at UCLA. Um, he's the author of uh, several books. I was just mentioning to him before we began that he probably needs to write a little slower or I need to read faster because I'm about two books behind in his bibliography. Um, so he's the author of Hammer and Ho, Alabama Communists During the Great Depression, Race Rebels, Culture, Politics, and the Black Working Class, Yo Mama's Dysfunctional, Fighting the Culture Wars in Urban America, and I think he's inviting some conversation about that because I believe we have some students here today who've right. read excerpts of that book, so we want to make sure that they get to engage him on that project. The Lonious Monk, The Life and Times of an American Original, and I believe he's been asked to, to make some comments about that as well. Um, one of my favorites, Freedom Dreams, The Black Radical Imagination, and Africa Speaks, America Answers, Modern Jazz, and Revolutionary Times. I'll just sort of say just uh, quickly on a personal note, um, Robin was, was when I was, um, for those of us who were in grad school or who were advanced undergrads in the 90s, he was um, one of these scholars, probably the singular scholar, um, that either you developed um, your personality around defending or trying to take down, right? He was, he was one of those those scholars. Um, I'll confess, I was in the latter category. Oh yeah, you're yeah, taking yeah, me I was, down. Yeah, That's right. I was I was in the latter category. Um, right. But he was yeah he was always of you interact with him. Always very humble. He never got weirded out by this. He took all of it in stride. And in some ways, I think you know, in retrospect, that's probably the best honor that you can give a scholar. Um, is to, because on either side, there's a recognition that the work matters and that it, 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 it registers. So um, it's, been, it's been good sort of getting to know him, I guess, now as a colleague and not just this guy, this Robin Kelly, what's your position on this article? Man, I don't know about this, you know, and sort of having these rumbles in, in graduate seminars. So on a personal note, so. Yeah. Um, yeah. Actually, can I take up with that? Because this, this is a very important yeah. uh, part of the conversation is that, I never thought about being taken down. I thought of it as you made me a much better oh. scholar and activist. You and Sundiata yeah. raised some real sharp criticism. And that's how we're going to frame it. Right. We were trying to make you a, a well, better scholar. No, no, no. That's but, where, that but don't was you the see, goal, I mean, so. I, I so appreciated that exchange. And, and this, this reminds us sort of, it, it kind of opens up what I want to uh, give a little sort of five, ten minutes to talk about. But, um, you know, these questions that you, that you, you all were raising, we were all raising, we're not just, these are not just academic questions. This is around the context of the Black Radical Congress, about the way we think about um, whether it's the long civil rights movement or whether we're thinking about you know, the relationship between race and class. I mean, these were life and death issues. These were issues about, about movement. And to me, it's precisely the critique that advances us. See, we, we're, we're, right now we're in a, in a period where a lot of, um, colleagues and young people think critique is actually hating on somebody, mm -hmm. you know, when it's actually loving the project of liberation. And I got love from you. you yes, and you did. I, I, no, I really did. <laughs> and that's how I felt. And, and that's why, you know, it's really important to be around, um, you know, younger scholars who are trying to speak the truth, because it's not about challenging a, a paradigm. It's about challenging um, systems that continue to reproduce themselves, you know, uh, and that's what we do. And so I really, I, that's why, you know, all the people who have critiqued me um, have been my best interlocutors. And that includes people on the extreme right, you know, who said ridiculous things, but there's always a core of something in the critique that's of value. Um, I wanted to, oh, I was told to open up by making a few remarks about something. Um, I had heard Thelonious Monk this morning in Starbucks, and I was thinking, well, that's maybe a sign that we should talk about him. But then I said, well, wait a second, there are all these other signs. The signs of, you know, the student 
ongoing student struggles on campus um, with you know Rock Chalk Invisible Hawk and some of the allies, um, which is which is part of a global movement. And we've got to remember that the student protests right now are part of a, part of a global movement. We talked about what's happening in the U.S., but you got to talk about Toronto. You got to talk about South Africa. You talk about Chile. Talk about Palestine. Um, a lot of these issues are coming up, um, and also the other opportunity. Uh, or sign, I should say, was this extraordinary article by Jennifer Hamer and uh, Clarence Lang. If you haven't read it, it's called Race, Structural Violence, and the Neoliberal University, The Challenges of Inhabitation, which came out in Critical Sociology. And that article does many things, but it reminds us that the universities themselves um, replicate the kind of racism uh, and structural violence that we often attend to outside the university, as if somehow the university is you know, immune from that stuff. And a lot of times we, we, um, we ignore that. And, and it's a brilliant article, and I really suggest that everyone read it, especially if you want to know what's happening here uh, at the University of Kansas. And then finally, the other sign was here I'm addressing the Hall Center, one of the leading centers in the humanities, right? And in some ways, um, the humanities is always said to be in crisis. Right, um, and I just thought about some of the books of Toby Miller, Martha Nussbaum. Um, if you go back to 1964, uh, there was a collection of, e of essays edited by J.H. Plum, the British historian, called Crisis in the Humanities. There's always been crisis. And the crisis is always um, represented or articulated as a problem of, a problem of relevance. Right? And one of the points you make in your article, which I think which shocked me, um, is that uh, in Florida, uh, there was an attempt on the part of this right-wing governor to put um, uh, a freeze on tuitions for fields that are considered basically money-making fields, you know, research, technology, tech, and then basically allow tuitions for the humanities to just go up, as if somehow in a kind of neoliberal move, you're going to sort of exclude those things that are co not considered money-making, as if somehow generating revenue is what the university is supposed to be about. Well, that's what it's become. We're university presidents are hired based on the ability to, to raise money. <laughs> you know, it's like sad. That's not my university. Um, it's always been that way, but we've been fooled. Um, so it's gotten worse. So these are the things that are, to me, signs of what we should be talking about. Um, you know, and so, you know, when you think about the, the clarion calls that students have been making across the country, a lot of the scholars who are proclaiming a crisis in the humanities are not paying attention to the students. Mm -hmm. So the students making these protests, and the students' protests are actually trying to transform the university. They're trying to make it a better place. They're trying to de-neoliberalize it. And Meanwhile, you got all these navel-gazing scholars like, how am I relevant? And so part of what they end up doing, and there was an article in The Guardian about this in England, where increasing numbers of scholars see relevance strictly as fleeing the university and going to the public realm. And whether it's through social media or whether it's through you know, being a, a talking head on a television show, that this somehow is what relevance means, that is influencing popular opinion. Because of course in university we all, we all have the answer. It's just a matter of taking on superior knowledge and re greeting the masses with our superior knowledge, which is ridiculous, right? If we had the answer, we wouldn't be thinking so hard, right? Um, we're trying to figure this out. So what it means, even if it means sacrificing analytical rigor in favor of impressionistic opinions and sound bites, that's what a lot of us end up doing. And, and for me, uh, and this I just want to conclude, which is a couple of remarks, I don't think it's our job as humanists to make ourselves relevant, but rather to ask the hard questions, to interrogate inherited categories, uh, to take nothing as self-evident, uh, to go to the root of the problem. It's not about the, com the, the accumulation of different facts. Facts are easy. Facts are invented. It's about reframing the question, you know? I mean, I, I look at Sherry Tucker, who's like one of the greatest scholars on the planet, and she completely reframed the study of jazz by asking a different set of questions, by saying, what does it mean to pay attention not just to gender, but to women who make music? 
is it just including a number of women, like adding them to the list and saying they're great too? No, she said no, it changes the whole character of the way we hear and understand and recognize that jazz music has been associated with a certain kind of masculinity. And that when that shifts, um, we tend to even hear differently. And why is that? She interrogates those questions. So it's not just a matter of facts. You could find names, but how do you rethink the project mm -hmm. itself? Um, and then the other thing, just real quickly, is that this, the, this work of, sort of, 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 the, of humanness, what, he, what humanities ought to do, is to a kind of address contemporary social crises. And I, I'm concerned sometimes that if we persist in conflating relevance, that is with the popular, that being relevant means to be in the popular, to be on MSNBC, um, that we, we conflate relevance with the popular, that the form or the forum will be our main concern. And if the forum is our main concern outside the academy, we ignore what we inhabit. And this is part of the argument that they're, they're making. Uh, meanwhile, as Hamer and Lang warn, in the quest for relevance, we flee the university, uh, and we don't always attend to what we call neoliberalization of the university. And, and that includes things. This is, they, they give a much longer and detailed explanation of what that means, and I really encourage you to read it, but just things that have come to, to my mind. The casualization of labor uh, at the university, teaching staff, um, outsourcing non-union labor, in the realms of maintenance and food services and security. And at, at a place like USC, uh, where I taught for uh, uh, five years, it was significant because outsourcing union labor meant that the mostly Latino staff who actually had the opportunity to send their kids to USC tuition free as part of the deal lost. So imagine what it meant to take a job where you're struggling cleaning up offices knowing that when your kid becomes college age, if, if she or he is accepted to USC, they get a free ride. You outsource means that they're no longer protected by the union and that, that benefit disappears. So these are things that we have to pay attention to, both as faculty, as students, that the people who clean up after us, the people who serve our food, are part of the university itself, right? So that's something that you all talk about. We talk about draconian cuts um, that are applied unevenly, rapidly rising tuitions, creeping privatization of public colleges and universities, um, the transfer of the burden of educational costs from the public to the individual student and her family, which results in unprecedented student debt. I'm looking at these young people here who actually took time out to stand in line to talk to me at night when they could be at home playing video games. And they're in high school, about to go to college, in, and they're witnessing all of the other college students carrying a trillion dollars worth of debt for an education? No wonder you can have a governor who says, we're going to freeze tuitions for the fields that could maintain our industrial and military complex, but the ones that actually challenge what we think of as common sense are the ones that we're just going to basically uh, um, uh, price out of existence. Right? That, that is immoral. It's just simply immoral. That's not the university that we imagine when people in the 1960s were struggling to transform it. And thank goodness there are young people trying to, to restore that. Last thing I want to say about student demands is I want to really support the students here because I think that some of the tendency to dismiss the demands is a misunderstanding of the demands themselves, let alone dismissing because of other reasons, <laughs> which we could talk about. But if you pay attention to the demands, they are essentially about transforming the university, pushing back neo the neoliberal turn, addressing long-standing institutional racism, not for the benefits of a minority of students, but for the entire university, including faculty, staff, um, and, and all students. Some of the demands about changing the climate uh, making privileged students aware of how racism creates a toxic environment for all, everyone, not just for students of color. Um, recognizing that uh, changing this environment means diversifying faculty and staff, transforming the curriculum. And transforming the curriculum is not about equal representation. We, we misunderstand this. It's not about like saying we want more names and more faces. That goes back to my point about Sherry Tucker's work. It's not enough to say we just want to have different experiences represented. 
it's about a deeper interrogation of the production of difference. The d a deeper interrogation of the production of difference. That is, difference is not natural. You know, there's not, it's, it's not, it's, there'll be different, there'll be natural differences, but the relationship between difference and power is produced. And that's what they're saying. If you change the curriculum, you begin to interrogate how difference is related to power. It's not a natural thing, but it's made in, in a process of power Can relationship. Can I ask you a, yeah. a question about that, Robin? And then maybe what we, I'll just ask you this one question, and then maybe we'll open it up or begin to open it up to the floor. Maybe beginning with uh, some questions from the students who've um, read an excerpt of, right. of your work. And this uh, refers to um, an article that you recently published, um, Black Study, Black Struggle, oh, okay. in um, the Boston Review. And I just want to just briefly read um, uh, an excerpt uh, from that, just a, a, a paragraph where you write, um, and this speaks to the point that you're making right. and sort of respond to that and then we'll shift gears. A common thread runs through both the more modest and more radical critics of universities. Both demand that universities change in ways that we cannot expect them to change. The first group asks universities to deliver on their promise to be post-racial havens, but that will not happen in a surrounding sea of white supremacy. The second sees universities as a leading edge in a socially revolutionary fight. While I share the transformative aims of the latter, I think that universities are not up to the task. Certainly universities can and will become more diverse and marginally more welcoming for black students, but as institutions, they will never be engines of social transformation. Such a task is ultimately the work of political education and activism. By definition, it takes place outside the university. Right, right. Um, although, just to, to add one other thing, I do make the argument that um, that the engines may be outside the university, but the university is in some ways the kind of a ground zero. It's a fundamental space and has always been a space um, for uh, initiating or responding to social crises. And what I mean by that, it's not the university administrations, it's not the university institutions, it's the students who come through there. Um, sometimes they come through and, and they're transient in the sense that they're there four years, five years. Um, but the, it's through the relationship between their connections to the world, the university's connections to the world, which oftentimes are very um, questionable. When, when you think about the post-war university is one that's tied directly to the Department of Defense, you know, uh, and to research and development. Um, and part of the protests that took place in the 1960s were about the relationship between university research and development and napalm, for example, or the companies that are actually um, funding research and development. So it's not like the university is, is like a, a haven, mm -hmm. um, but students are coming from all kinds of places. They're, they're learning about these relationships. They're learning about the relationship between the communities they left and why there's the maintenance of reproduction of poverty, why conditions are worsening and the university. And so in some respects, it's not that the university, um, I'm saying that the university is not an engine of social change, but the space becomes that because of the student protest. Um, so that, that sort of uh, answers the question. I know that there was a lot of pushback on that article on, uh, from uh, some colleagues who really do believe that the university uh, is the um, the the last bastion of real liberalism, and I'm 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 critical of liberalism because I, I think the con contemporary liberalism still has roots with uh, in John Stuart Mill and John Locke and all these other people. But um, and I I don't believe I don't even believe that. Um, and again, it's not that it's not about a belief in. Mm. It's about a recognition of the limitations of trying to transform institutions that are already Im institutions embedded in systems of power that reproduce the kinds of inequalities that people are trying to address. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, I actually had other things, which hopefully we'll get to just about. So why don't we do this? I mean, maybe sort of take a few questions yes. from, the, from the floor and then we can, s we can come back to that and make sure. Yeah. You'll get the last word, I promise. Right, I just <laughs> want to make sure that, that I could say something about the multicultural um, 
student government. Okay, I'd like to hear from you about that. So that's, <laughs> let's keep that in the chamber. Okay. But I want to sort of make sure, and uh, for those of you who have questions, if you could raise your hand so we can give you the microphone um, for the purposes of, of recording, that would be that would be great. Right. <clears throat> and I should say, everything's on the table. You yeah. can ask me any question on the planet. I'll even answer personal questions. You know, you, you, I, know, I know some of you know my wife was on um, the, the show. Um, uh, what's, that, what's that TV show? That you better know the answer to that. I know. Because I, I, it's, it's not a show that I like, but, but people keep asking me questions about... Um, uh, <laughs> we'll edit that, in, right, you can edit that. Uh, so it doesn't get out. So. <laughs> House of Cards. So she was on House of Cards. People keep asking, well, well what's it like? Because people like House of Cards. We don't like it, but she, she, she has, it's, a, it's a gig. Um, okay. I, I think you have a question. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I'm just joking. Uh, <laughs> I don't have a question about the House of Cards. Okay. In thinking about universities, infrastructures, and structures, um, and of course, the staff and support staff are a key part in that. But I'm also, because I am one, really curious about your take on contingent faculty and adjunct faculty and the rise of the use of part-time contractual right. workers who have no benefits, who have no job security, and yet they are handed the responsibility for, in some cases, who use 70% adjunct faculty. Right. Um, they are the trainers, they are the teachers of the student body that's trying to be attracted to that institution. Right, right. Well, this is classic neoliberal strategy. That is lower um, labor costs, and, and try to generate as much value um, or profit from lower labor costs. And this has been the trend. I, we witness it in two different realms. One is the continued casualization of the teaching staff, the creation of non-tenured um, categories, uh, adjunct teaching, and the, um, the continued use of graduate student labor uh, and to try to hedge against unionization by turning graduate student teaching into part of a fellowship package. So the idea is that you know they're not really working; this is part of their, their training. So this is this has had an enormous impact. Um, the fact of the matter is that many of the people who do adjunct training, adjunct teaching, are great teachers. You know, they're doing way way more work, um, and as long as they continue to do well in terms of training students, the kinds of, of um, mass resistance on the part of people paying this tuition may not be apparent, because they're like, well, we're getting an education. And, 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 uh, and, and the fact that adjunct teaching is often masked, you know, it's not visible to the students. All they know is this is the professor, right? The way around that, of course, is the way around trying to s resolve almost any labor dispute, and that is unionization. And the university, I, I can't say the university because every place is different, but um, there's a tendency to resist uh, union recognition, uh, to resist the um, attempts by unions to secure tenure for um, adjunct teachers who have been teaching the same course for an X number of years, for example, to say that you know you can't continue to do that unless you actually get tenure or have a chance to get tenure. This is the sort of thing that that's that's a big it's a big battle. Um, I, on the other hand, I don't think that the old system of just tenuring faculty and the whole I think that system is dying, but it can't be replaced by a system of insecurity that exploits basically all these PhDs in a glutted job market, you know? Um, so I think there's, there's a lot of work to be done, um, but right now it's, it's unfair labor practices. And one last thing I should say about this, I've been very disappointed with um, my own colleagues in their uh, failure to stand up on behalf of adjunct faculty, part-time faculty. Uh, because they're concerned about their own position, right? And that's not solidarity. And we can't have, and it's impossible to build solidarity in a culture 
in which professors see themselves as independent contractors and entrepreneurs, not as part of a community of working people. You know, um, even though salaries are off the charts for some people, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't have some s sense of solidarity and transform the system. Um, students, I, I, I imagine, are often the best at, once they recognize a problem, standing up. You know, so I think working with student organizations to, to understand how the system works would be really valuable you know, for the future. Other questions? And then I promise we're going to turn back yeah. to, yeah, over here. Hi. Um, you mentioned that the university itself replicate violence and uh, racism that we attend to outside of the U.S. Yeah, this is that uh, Clarence. Yeah. I was wondering general. if you can expand on that, how you see uh, the obvious and not so obvious ways that manifest itself. Right. Um, in terms of replicating racism and violence, yeah. Well, in, in terms of replicating racism, there's just a whole um, litany of ways. I mean, uh, and, and I could speak to my university, for example. Um, and, and, and what I want to focus on, because rather than give you a list of things, I want to focus on a change that has taken place um, over the last 15, 20 years, or at least since I've been, I was in college 30 years ago. Um, at the UC system, as a result of the general opposition to affirmative action and other forms of trying to create equity on uh, college campuses, uh, we had like Proposition 209, which basically made, um, made it illegal to use race as a, a factor for admissions. That basically disappeared much of our um, student of color um, uh, student body. So when I was in college, uh, we had like twice more black students, maybe three times more black and brown students on campus at UCLA. Um, and many of them came from very various walks of life in terms of the class background. Um, that number just dropped to almost nothing. And then, number one. Number two, it, it isolated students. It reduced whatever kind of voice and power. And it did not, the university did not create systems to protect or defend their interests. So they end up being kind of an isolated, even smaller minority with no voice whatsoever. Um, that opened the path uh, for a kind of reaction to what they call political correctness, right? Um, both on the part of some elements of the faculty, the administration say, you know what, those days are over. The student protests of the 60s and 70s are dead. Now it's time to go back to basics. And go back to basics is to try to replicate a university that never really existed. That is one that sort of is pure knowledge that is neutral, neutral in terms of race, gender, sexuality, ethnicity. Um, and that everything that is not considered neutral then gets housed in departments of ethnic studies and you know, Af gender studies and that sort of thing um, as a separate entity altogether. Um, so on the one hand, it looks as though we've made all this progress and we have more ethnic studies departments and programs and um, gender sexuality and all this other stuff's going on, but they end up not necessarily having the, the, um, the expanse across the whole campus, transforming the whole curriculum so that there's pockets rather than a transformation. Um, so there's that. And then the other thing is that just that in terms of the levels of racism, uh, we, people call it microaggression. Uh, you know, that's, that's a newfangled way to say just like straight up racism. You know, um, if, you, if you read a book like Manning Marable's um, How Capitalism Underdeveloped Black America, he has a chapter where he talks about the student protests, student racism on campus in the 1980s. It's the same story. It doesn't, and you literally could take those, uh, those stories and just, and just put a different date on it. You saw it in the 80s, you saw it in the 90s, you saw it in the 2000s, 21st century. It doesn't change. Um, so in some respects, there's this continuation of forms of racism that the university will always uh, create a committee to look into, to do a kind of you know, um, <laughs> interrogation, and then nothing ever happens with that. So in some respects, th these are the everyday lives, and those lives, those experiences get dismissed. And when students protest about it, something is sort of done, but it never actually leads to kind of institutional changes. So it's built in, right? Um, and that's just on the question of like 
there's certain forms of racism. We, we can go on and on and on. In terms of structural violence, um, there's lots of different levels of violence, you know, and and I'm my own concern um, is not just about the structural violence that takes place in respect to um, uh, the the student experiences, but the university's role in global violence, you know. Um, in so when I talk about research and development, uh, or when I talk about like the the rest restoration of ROTCs on campuses, when we talk about um, you know just the what has actually happened in terms of the university's complicity in global war, to me, that's something that students are also trying to, to deal with. Um, the, the, the heart of the anti-war movement uh, began in universities, you know, um, and not just, not just in the 1960s, you can see the 1930s, you know. Um, so those are some examples. I think. Can I make sure, just I uh, know that there we have some high schools. Right. Very good. Yeah, please yeah. go. Uh, can you wait for the microphone, please? Mm -hmm. right. Oh. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah. All right. Um, so in the book that we were reading, Your Mama's Dysfunctional, in the chapter Looking Forward, you talk about the university um, labor and wage issues. And oh, I did? Even then? Yes, you, you did. Well, I was ahead of my time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, no, I, I'm sorry, I forgot about that. I haven't read that book in a long yes, time, you, so you tell yeah, me about it. Yeah, you talked about it in your right. chapter. And in the chapter, Looking Forward, um, I think you offer your insight on the solution to this problem right. and quote, uh, I'm suggesting that the only way to implement changes, whether at a policy level, a personal level, or a broad cultural level, is through collective struggle. And this collective struggle, I think, um, in this chapter, you talk about not just African Americans, but also a lot of other minorities, including right. women, right. and these historically un unprivileged groups. And uh, I guess my question is, Looking into the future, do you think the race, uh, the race issue in America, moving to a positive direction, or do you think it will be increasingly intense? Because uh, last year in New York, there was a shooting of African American done by not a white policeman I but a Chinese policeman, and there were demonstrations a few months ago around um, all over America by both African Americans and the Chinese community and protesting for different things, obviously. So do you think as um, the other minority groups getting increasingly vocal about their civil rights, do you think it's possible to, do you think in the future it's gonna be um, everyone working together together for the collective struggle? Or do you think it's the race issue is gonna be um, even more complicated than it was before and even more intense? Excellent question. Th there's uh, three different lev layers on that question. W one is a definition of collective struggle. And by collective struggle, um, I really do mean that uh, I was pushing back against the idea of the think tank as the answer, that somehow we just, if we just get the right knowledge, we can sort of trans translate that knowledge into policy. Policy will be good and everything will be resolved. Um, collective struggle doesn't necessarily mean like masses and masses of people. It basically means that you can't you can't um, develop strategies sort of on your own based on your superior knowledge. Uh, the civil rights movement was not a mass movement. People get shocked a shock when I say that. Um, it was never a mass movement, meaning that the majority of say the African American community in the South wasn't actually involved. They were affected by it. But it didn't take that much. If you look at an organization like SNCC in Mississippi, they got lots of people involved to, pr to participate, but the core organizers, like you could count them. You know, I mean, that's what's amazing. And that's collective struggle, to be able to, to build alliances and build uh, units of people who together with their collective sort of thinking and collective strategies of civil disobedience make change. Okay, so there's that. Now, on the question of of like what does that mean in terms of multiracial issues or even the issue of racism? Well, you know, you mentioned New York. New York's a really good example. Baltimore is a good example. Because in Baltimore, Freddie Gray was killed by um, b black cops and white cops. The issue of police violence, pl um, you know, the media likes the idea of a white cop killing a black person because it creates drama and it personalizes. 
And for those people who defend the police, um, it's easy to mark an individual rogue cop as a bad apple in a good system. Our president does that. He's like, it's a good system, we just have bad apples. Um, and so when black cops are killing black people all the time, Atlanta, Detroit, you got predominantly black police officers killing black people all the time. That doesn't mean that that's not tied to structural racism. It's t totally tied to structural racism because um, structural racism basically means that these are systems in place that, that operate unequally. There's no equal protection. Um, and so you can be a cog in the machine and be part of that system that operates unequally. So, and again, forgive me for this kind of shift, but you take a place like Flint, Michigan, which is predominantly black, but not entirely black. You got all kinds of people across racial lines, Asian, Latino, and white, who are affected by the poisoning of the water system when they shift from the Detroit River to the Flint River, um, which means that it's precisely systems of structural racism and class inequality that made that even happen. But who, who suffers more than just black people suffer? Just like black people end up being parts of systems that reproduce their own inequality. That, you, know, you see what I'm saying? So if we think of collective struggle as trying to get like, all the black people together and all the Asian Americans together and all the white people together, um, we end up falling into the trap of thinking that our identity equals our politics, or rather our skin color or our heritage, our identity, our, our, we got to think about identities as political identities. If you think of our identities as political identities, then suddenly anti-racism is not identity politics. Anti-racism is a political stance that you take. And if you're anti-racist um, as, say, a young Asian American person, that wherever racism exists, you battle it, whether it's no, Islamophobia, anti-black racism, um, or anti-Asian racism, right? Whatever it is, you battle it. If you are a, a, a young African American and you are anti-racist, it means that all forms of racism you challenge. It's, it's just too narrow to say, like, I'm just dealing with my own, you know? That's not the same, th and as long as you think of, of, of identity policies dealing with your own, then that won't produce the kind of synergy that's required to dismantle these structures, right? Um, and we also can't beat up people who say, that's why I don't, I'm not always crazy about the word ally. I understand it, but, and I always think of, of John Brown as an example of, of someone who's a comrade as, as opposed to an ally, because to be a comrade means that you're completely invested, uh, linked arms with people who are trying to transform the world that they're in. If you're an ally, you're on the side being prepared to step in on behalf of, rather than claiming it as your own. When you say, I'm against um, structural violence and racism, then you basically do you devote your life to standing up against that. And, um, and, and it's be it becomes your identity, right? So when people come to me and stuff, they come to me and they say, they're like, oh God, you know, I can't tell, you know, are you, are you mixed? Uh, are you, are you black? Are you, are you, oh, you, you must be from the Caribbean. Oh no, are you Arab? Are you, you know, I'm like, I'm a socialist, baby. <laughs> you know, like, what does that mean? Like, I'm an anti-racist. I'm, a, this is what I am, right? So in some respects, we can, we can claim political identities as, as our own. You know, uh, without necessarily disavowing what it means to be in someone else's skin, because one of the 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 um, the pitfalls of racism is that no matter what you think you are, the world is trying to define you. The fact that I get the question, "What are you?" The fact that when Clarence goes driving down the street, it's not like the cops know that he's Professor Clarence Lang. You know, there's nothing on him that looks, he got nice glasses and everything, <laughs> but they're, they're like, he, 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 is, he is a threat to the state, you know? Um, or it works in other ways. You know, it works in terms of like the, the whole minor, model minority myth. 
Of course you're not supposed to be in humanities and in sciences, and you're good at it. What, you got to see? Oh my God, what's wrong with you? You know, these are, these are the kinds of things that operate. So we, we end up not being able to define ourselves. You, you know, see um, white people walking around. We assume that all white people ex experience and benefit from the same amount of enormous privilege, right? And that's not true either. So in some respects, we've got to break the cycle by developing new political identities while also attending to the way in which racism ends up def defining, putting um, barriers and limits around us, what we could do. Okay, anyway. Go ahead. Right, that's actually a really good question. Um, forgive me, because I got my little thing here, and I, and I, I have a definition of neoliberal, whoops, um, which I may have to go by memory, but, um, uh, but it does make a difference. Uh, a definition makes a difference. So in some respects, there are, there, there are those who use neoliberalism sort of as a, um, uh, as an adjective, right, for everything that's just bad. <laughs> you know, like whatever is bad is like it's neoliberal. Um, and in fact, I was talking to Ruthie Gilmore about this, because she was, we had a dissertation defense and the, the, the issue came up. Um, uh, at the same time, I see I don't have my computer with me, I'm gonna go by, by memory, my old memory. Um, but I do think that there is a working definition. Um, I know people also tend to think about Michel Foucault, and biopolitics and the issue about governance. My working definition is, has a lot to do with uh, relationships of political economy. In the history of neoliberalism that you know, people like David Harvey, uh, although I think David Harvey sometimes is a little bit too rigid, um, or even Daniel Stebbins Jones wrote a book called Masters of the Universe, which is a kind of evolution of neoliberal thought. Uh, and he argues that it's a transatlantic idea. So, Neoliberalism could be understood as an attempt to uh, restore elements of classical liberalism, to seize liberalism from what, what we call social liberalism. So in the, short, the short version of the story is that right around um, World War I, uh, with the Progressive Party, with even Woodrow Wilson, uh, with the reformers, um, progressives, so-called progressives, liberalism became um, associated with an expansive state, uh, labor protections like ending child labor, um, w you know, uh, wage protections. This is all World War I and post-war period. Um, but it also became associated with, uh, with democratization. So issues like having um, initiatives on the ballot, for example, referenda. These are all developments of the early 20th century. The, the fact that 19, uh, it was, a, uh, I guess, 1913 when uh, you have direct election senators, for example. So, so liberalism becomes the opposite of what it started to be. Liberalism in some ways em em emerged in the, 17, in the 18th and 19th centuries as an ex extension of the Enlightenment project. Um, associated with small government, associated with free markets, free trade, um, the liberalization of, of trade, the um, privatization of the commons, you know, things that are about developing um, a capitalism that can flow easily. And the reason why free trade uh, was associated with small governments was because in those days you didn't have income tax. So tariffs were the ways that states ge generated revenues. Right, so then social liberalism kind of takes off. Then from from World War One, you get the New Deal, which is the extreme version of the social liberalism, and it's the opposite of the idea of the 19th century liberal. Right, uh, so when people like Friedrich Hayek and Milton Friedman is a little bit different, George Stigler and all these other people, they come together and they say, you know what, we need to restore the old liberalism because this. 
because what they were dealing with during the crisis of planning, um, they just came out of, um, or they were in the midst of the, the, the rise of fascism uh, and the Nazis. And they're also in the midst of the this, this Soviet Union lasting more than they thought it would last. They thought that bad boy would be crushed in about a decade, but it didn't. It continued to exist. And so the idea, so Hayek and others argue that central planning is just a dangerous thing. Central planning produces fascism. It's a mistake, and I could talk about why it's a mistake, but that's a long story. I teach your class on this. Um, so that idea of central planning and critiquing it became the heart of what becomes the kind of neoliberal turn in thinking. But that turn wasn't necessarily, I mean, to be honest, I'm not defending Hayek, because Hayek and Milton Friedman, they said there's some places where you got to have government intervention, like healthcare. Like Hayek wasn't against things like, you know, um, single payer healthcare, right? So at some point, these ideas circulate, they foment, they develop, but they're not adopted because after World War II, the Keynesian vision of, of the world becomes a dominant one. That is, John Maynard Keynes, the idea of saving capitalism. Keynes wasn't anti-capitalist, he was totally for capitalism, for a, an efficient capitalism, an efficient capitalism based on the Bretton Woods Agreement, the, the dollar being sort of the, the measure of all currency, you know, against which we build all. So, so by the 1970s, something happens. You have this econo global economic crisis for various reasons it can't go into, where and, and that crisis creates an opportunity for new forms of reorganizing um, the relationship between the state and the economy. And hence, you get neoliberal uh, policies, which are not limited to Republicans or Democrats. Mm -hmm. And those policies involve, one, um, fiscal policies that reduce taxes on the wealthy, on the, on the argument that if you lower taxes, it generates more um, capital to be able to invest, right? Uh, monetary policy, which is about allowing the, the, the currencies to float rather than be tied to um, gold standards or, 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 or some other kind of systems of monetary backing. Um, it means privatization o of the public resources so that you turn things like water into a commodity to sell. You turn things like, you know, government uh, supports into commodities to sell, you know. You, 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 you outsource a lot of public resources to private institutions as based on this idea that free market principles are the best. Um, and then ultimately, that's just part of it. I mean, then you have increased expenditures on militarization, um, free trade policies that turn certain regions or countries into workshops for northern, the global north. Um, and those workshops are places where you do exactly what we're talking about with the university. You eliminate um, union protections. You eliminate environmental protections for the sake of creating the cheapest commodity as possible. And those cheap commodities can then compete on the world market. And so the idea is that loosening all these things to produce a capitalism that's supposed to be more efficient. But the result is massive, massive inequality, the erosion of, of public resources, the disappearance of a public safety net, a social safety net for poor people. I mean, and this is the result. Um, the, the ideas of the Hayek's and Friedman's in the past, whatever their virtues or limitations, then get taken up by um, think tanks whose object is no longer to create the most efficient economy. The object is to make as much money as possible and wage class warfare on the poor. And so when the Koch brothers embody a certain kind of neoliberal set of policies, their whole thing is not about the rule of law, it's not about fairness, it's not about free trade. It's about making sure that they can create a system possible where they pay no taxes, mm -hmm. where the government basically works for them and not for the poor, and where life is disposable. The disposability of life is not a new thing. Mm -hmm. But now, one of the things that all neoliberals sort of argued is that inequality is just natural. It's just natural. You can't have equality. And, and for Hayek, he argues in Road to Serfdom. And by the way, 
you got to read all this stuff. You can't just talk it. You got to read. You got to read. You know, Capitalism and Freedom by Milton Friedman. I read all that stuff, and Friedman. I mean, Hayek's whole thing is that, of course, once you try to address inequality through state intervention, you are creating an unequal situation because you're actually um, leaning in um, on the side of people who are disadvantaged. If you dis if you make those things disappear, that is, don't no intervention at all through the natural order of things. If they work hard enough and find out some other ways, there are opportunities for them to rise up in this schema. Robin, let yeah. me just, I want to sort of check I'm in. Sorry. How much more time do we have? What time is this officially over? Oh, yeah, okay, got, okay, yeah, good. I just want to make sure. So I want to make sure we were budgeting. So I just want to. Um, I'm think, not budgeting. I'm sorry. <laughs> but that's, that's, that's supposed to be my role. So yeah, you don't I'm, have I'm, to. So I'm it's, it's, it's great. We're doing well, though, it sounds like. So great. So I want to make sure you have time to talk about the MSG, and I might throw some more other questions yeah. at you. But uh, yeah, please. Uh, Robin. Yes. I want, um, I'm interested in your analysis of the ideological component of neoliberalism. Mm -hmm. um, I told Clarence a few days ago um, that when 9-11 um, happened, I said, okay, th th this is, this is going to be the change, right? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. um, and I came into, I'm an old poet, so I came into the academy writing about resistance poets like Jane Cortez, right. oh, I love Amiri Jane. Baraka, yeah, right. right? You know, and Gil Scott Heron, and all of them, all of them saw this coming, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's an 1882 poem by uh, Baraka, I forget the, the title, but he says, He's talking about driving in New York, and he says, I keep seeing Nazis, and since they're mm. young, young people in the room, I won't say what he says, but they're no-ish Nazis. That's what he mm. says, right? Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. um, Jane Cortez, in a poem, Brooding, 1977, she's talking about the kind of anger among white workers, right, that, you know, um, Gil Scott Heron said, talks right. about the winter, all these things. And it seems to me that um, in the last 20 years or so, you really don't have, after they get off the scene, after they're sort of removed, um, and it's, maybe it's just me, but I don't see um, or haven't seen uh, a logic or much expression that either is fundamentally opposed to uh, capital or the logic of capital, those sorts of values, right. um, or, or posit a substantive alternative, uh, which is what all of those people had been about one way or another, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. you know, I was wondering if you could talk right, about right. that a little That's bit. That's an excellent question. And, it's, and it actually, it, it does speak to the crisis of the 70s. Because one thing I did focus on, just in my little explanation, was the global crisis uh, in terms of the, um, the economic downturn with the recession, the OPEC nations. But the other side of it was, you know, after three decades, is that right? Two decades at least, um, of unsustainable growth in the economy uh, at the expense of uh, people of color for the most part, particularly African Americans. Because the, the, the great growth period of the 1960s was a period in which government uh, spending actually went to creating, expanding suburbs and valuing, you know, basically predominantly white, ultimately segregated communities at the expense of black and brown communities, and you see the deterioration of cities at a time when you have this massive growth. That's the presumption, you know. Um, and so you, we begin to see that, but then um, when the 70s crisis hit, the first response on the part of working people was the strike wave. The, one of the biggest strike waves in the history of the United States is in the 70s. Um, in response to uh, the downturn in the economy, uh, in response to um, uh, wage freezes and layoffs. And a lot of the white workers didn't expect that after owning homes and do, I mean, the crisis of 2008 in some ways was significant, but the one in the 70s was very much 
like that. And it's not an accident that, um, you know, neo-fascism, Nazism, the Klan, they, they, they've always bubbled under the surface. But the 70s was a rapid increase. The Klan is restored in the 70s. They're running for office in California in like 1975. Um, Neo-Nazis, you get, you get this, the uh, um, uh, assassination attempts, home burnings, uh, and you get all these you know, uh, early forms of, of sort of pseudo-fascism among largely, but not entirely, working class white people. So when Barack is describing that, he, what he's describing is real. And of course, some of that stuff plays out on college campuses. One of the big mythologies, you know, is that somehow like the white, it's the white working class that has made this kind of right wing turn. Trump supporters are not necessarily white working class, a lot of them are white middle class and college educated white people, right? Um, and the same thing in the 70s where it, it's not simply class anger, it's also uh, racial resentment because the kinds of struggles that in, this, in spite of the inequalities, part of the struggles that emerged in the 70s were struggles to expand the welfare state. The expansion of the welfare state wasn't um, an LBJ thing. We, it was the National Welfare Rights Organization that pushed to increase the welfare roles because they struggled to, cr to remove the stigma of welfare. So imagine what it means to remove the stigma of welfare among, led by women of color mostly, at a moment when neoliberal ideology is about stigmatizing anyone who gets government support, except for Lockheed, Boeing, you know, um, the defense uh, industry, um, and white suburbia. So the part of the ideology of neoliberalism, um, which is a racial ideology as well, it's about stigmatizing those who can't help themselves as it's masking the role of the state in upholding uh, capital in crisis, right? Because resolving the problem of the 70s was about state intervention, you know, in some realms and the withdrawal of the state in other realms. While that's happening, um, and this is under Carter, this is under Ford, this is under Nixon, this is under Reagan especially, but Reagan is basically a continuation of some of the policies that preceded him, right? Um, Meanwhile, unions are perceived as drains on society. It's like a reversal. Unions were like the great machine, the great engine for the success of the black work of the of the of the American working class to become a middle class. Then it becomes like so. Then you have Reagan attacking the the uh, air traffic controllers union, which is just the beginnings of a total dismantling of trade union and then trade union ideology. Um, by the 1980s. Um, that the, the, the sensibility of the early 70s that somehow w the state is our state and therefore the state is, is our state to protect our interests, to make sure that there's no one who's suffering, to make sure that public education is actually expanding. By the 1980s, you get a series of, of reversals where you got the massive creation of an underclass, the underclass discourse, which is a neoliberal discourse, of people who basically have not worked hard enough and, and their poverty is a product of their culture. You know, uh, the, it's not an accident. The undercla underclass discourse coincides directly uh, with um, uh, what I talked about uh, last night in terms of broken windows theory, uh, uh, policing. Um, that then is tied uh, to um, uh, this idea um, that, uh, oh, um, that um, forgot. I lost my train of thought on the last thing. But but these are the the, the, the shifts that are taking place in the 1980s, um, and the dismantling of those kinds of uh, public institutions. Oh, I know what it was: public education. The last thing that that I just want to mention uh, is that part of the ideology of uh, neoliberalism is the grassroots tax revolt. And so I know in California, it, it affected all over the country, but California is very clear because what ends up happening is that the boom in property values, not for black people, by the way, <laughs> not for them, but the boom in property values meant that you had all these communities of white homeowners 
who bought their homes at about fifteen or twenty thousand dollars by um, by the nineteen seventies, those homes are worth about a hundred and thirty, a hundred and forty, two hundred thousand dollars in some cases, and a lot of them had paid off much of the mortgage, and their taxes have gone up sky, sky high. So the, and this re it's real. So as their taxes go up, it goes up at a moment when their incomes freeze, or they're laid off, or they're struggling with economic. So then their whole thing is, we're going to basically resist um, more taxes, property taxes. By doing that, in California, they, prop what's, they passed what's called Proposition 13. Proposition 13 ultimately um, re dramatically reduced um, tax revenue used for public schools. Schools declined. They went from the best public schools in the country to some of the worst, just in a matter of years. And that then has a, 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 an accelerator effect, right? Because the schools that were already bad now are pretty bad, and the schools that are, were bad before are worse which then makes it almost difficult for students to try to enter into college coming from low income, particularly so-called communities of color, at a time when college tuitions were fairly low for public schools and then they start to go up as part of the neoliberal project. So that whole thing created much of the conditions that we're dealing with today in the 70s and 80s. Um, I just want to make sure that, that we pay attention to the role that these struggles play to try to reverse the process. And in some respects, it's not, neoliberalism didn't emerge um, and didn't win ideologically simply mm -hmm. um, without opposition. Right. It was a defeat of some of the social movements. And in respects, I would even argue that um, Obama's election um, represents, in some respects, the defeat of the, the, the kind of radical economic vision of the civil rights movement. So let me let's let's do this. Um, I know, I know. I, no, no, I short, is, short answers. No, this is this is fine. But um, maybe as a way of sort of getting a lot of things on on the table, there's a question over here from from Jake and a question from from Ben. And so maybe if both of you right. ask your questions and then you speak to them both, and then what I would like to see if there's an interest, if one of our another one of our high school scholars has a question, that could come forward. And then there's a question I want to ask you okay. that could allow you maybe to talk ab about the MSG, the right. Multicultural um, uh, Student Government, right. which you wanted to mention. So if you all are fine with that, let's kind of make that and then we'll do the rest. Yeah, with Not I'll give you shorter answers. Like, these, are, these are big questions, they though, are. you know? They are. They are. Okay, sure. Um, I, I have a question that goes back to the discussion of, of uh, contingent faculty labor. Uh -huh. um, and when you were talking about uh, the way that um, the way that our, our adjunct colleagues, uh, you know, work work extremely hard and are often brilliant teachers, um, working a lot harder for each each teaching dollar, it made me think that a lot of um, uh, adjunct faculty are also brilliant scholars mm -hmm. who are doing research for free. Right. And thinking about the way that adjunctification seems to be uh, partly, anyway, an effort or a move to eliminate. Uh, knowledge production is something that you get paid to do. Mm -hmm. um, and when you think about that, when you think about the, um, the adjunct ranks as the reserve army, uh, then those of us, you know, in a tenure stream position, fewer and fewer, right? right. It, it starts to seem like the opportunity to produce knowledge becomes not something that you're compensated for, but it becomes compensation itself. Right, right. And so, you know, in, there, there are different ways to respond to that, I think. And you mentioned Martha Nussbaum and the right. sort of what we need to restore the humanities right. or we need to shore up the right. university. Right. What my question for you is, and I'm just guessing that you might know something about this, I wonder what sorts of other spaces or other um, uh, initiatives uh, you may know of or that we should be imagining where knowledge production happens with or without the university. Right, right. Okay, okay that's so, a good question. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Well, this question is totally different. Uh, that's it's okay, <laughs> but I, I can give it a shot. Yeah. I wanted to return to last night's lecture uh, about war, which I, you know, very much uh, enjoyed and was impressed by, and um, it reminded me of uh, a lot of different arguments. And um, Steve Hahn makes a very similar argument about slavery as a form of war, and I teach slavery as a form mm -hmm. of war, uh, but I'm partly sort of practicing sympathy for the devil, 
literally, and thinking, well, how is this going to, how does this work rhetorically, right? Um, because you can also say, well, we have long traditions of war. We valorize war. We say that wars are, you know, generally fought by uniformed armies, even though they're not, usually, you know, always. Uh, they have treaties. They have ends. Um, it also, so by using this metaphor of war, then are we perhaps even, could that be perversely seen as almost um, an understanding of the ways of uh, the workings of white racism as, well, this was unofficial war. Mm -hmm. And so by that logic, would it be more useful in some instances to talk about things like that we understand to be very different than war, such as, say, ethnic cleansing mm -hmm. or genocide? Um, and that leads me to a second question, which is that uh, then, uh, by extension, should we be talking about different instantiations of war instead of saying Mike Brown's death is part of this, you know, 500 or 600 or uh, however you want to call it, centuries long war, instead of saying uh, there's many ways in which uh, the, the, our contemporary moment is a different kind of a war that's very different than the war of slavery and emphasizing difference instead of um, similarity across, you know, this, uh, you know, emphasizing right. difference as much as similarity right. when we're talking so about now, that. So now, let me do something with all of yeah, that. Let, let me let me let me so. let me take this first, yeah. and then I'll come back to yours. Um, I, I didn't want to give the impression that that it was that this unbroken war wasn't without difference. In fact, what, one of the main points I made about the Civil War was that this was different. It was actually radically different from others. I was simply trying to make the argument that um, it not use war as metaphor. I mean, literal. I mean, I didn't want, uh, by talking about slavery as war, I, didn't, I don't think of it as a metaphor. I think that, that that's the problem, that we think of it as a metaphor. But that it was literally the violent extraction of human beings through, force of, through, through military means. And it's not necessarily, that doesn't necessarily mean that those who are doing the extraction are all European. It simply means that everyone understands that the demand is produced through a plantation system, which generates this demand for human beings, which can only be extracted through force of violence. So I, I'm saying that I didn't even make that up, that those petitions like Prince Hall, or that Frederick Douglass, or that all, you know, all the people who have been writing about the experience of slavery have always described it as the word John Brown. And so, and they were saying not metaphorically, but literally. And, and that is masked by the question, the liberal, liberal ideology of, of human, human beings as property or persons held in service. So that was my main, my main thing. Um, in thinking about the, the genealogy of, of Mike Brown's death, um, there are all these ruptures that take place throughout, you know. And of course, I didn't have time to go through the whole history of 500 years, but, but it's those ruptures that really do matter, that um, in some respects, um, you know, one of the things I took out of my talk was the Geneva Conventions, and that in some respects, it, what happened to Mike Brown was an act of collective punishment, which under the Geneva Conventions is, a, is illegal. That the fact that we even have laws of war as a 20th century phenomenon, um, as a, an attempt, as internationalization, that's significant. It changes the terms. But in some respects, I also argue that the reason Geneva Conventions don't apply has to do with the fact that there's a kind of intense militarization um, not of police in the form of, of weapons, but certainly in terms of the relationship between police, policing and the question of public safety, or the policing and the question of communities that are considered disposable. So the history of their disposability is not a fi it's not an unbroken line. It's actually new developments that have to do with these earlier conversations about neoliberalism. So I agree with you that, that we've got to sort of look at these ruptures and changes, um, but that unless we recognize the way in which these kinds of violences are products of a longer war, what ends up happening is, we f what I was pushing back against was this idea that we fall into the trap of saying the police are necessary, but they're just bad, mm. they're just badly trained. We just need to train them, train them differently. Um, what I believe, I, I support the position of the surrealists, that is disband the army, open the prisons. I don't know if that answers the question, but we could talk more about this. Um, so in terms of this question of, um, of free research 
in adjuncts and alternative right. uh, spaces. Um, I totally agree that there is there are ways in which um, uh, adjunct labor and the reorganization and restructuring of the university has produced these opportunities to exploit um, research, exploit workers doing research for which they're not being paid. Um, and that is both a new development, but it's also built into the university system itself, and it's been for a long time. Um, uh, you know, we think about the exploitation of graduate student um, researchers and how they may get a fellowship and they do your research for you, and then they um, end up, you know, you end up, they end up being low wage labor for faculty who then take their stuff and then publish it, right? It happens all the time. Um, and so I think the, the tragedy, of course, is that in a market economy, um, research becomes a commodity. Uh, and our ability to reproduce ourselves as human beings, right, uh, require finances because we don't have a commons. We don't have, you know, uh, any means to support ourselves except through a money economy. And so in some respects, it is exploitative and it's very problematic and, and we have to sort of pay attention to that. Um, at the same time, in terms of alternative spaces, my experience has been uh, how to work with uh, grassroots organizations, with community organizations, uh, with communities that actually are doing research. It's not about, trans it's not about doing research for communities um, as much as recognize doing that, that's important but also recognizing that certain research is actually being generated mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. And that um, you think about two examples. Um, I write in this article, the Black Study, Black Struggle article, about some examples of the Institute for the Black World in Atlanta, uh, which was established um, by people like Vincent Harding, and, you know, um, Abdullah Kalimat and others, where their idea was to create a different kind of think tank whose project was to conduct research and bring speakers and try to attend to the needs of the, of the black world, Africa, the Caribbean, North America, everywhere, um, and create radical revolutionary uh, uh, insights through radical revolutionary research. Um, yes, they got some funding, but basically they were trying to be independent. The community university, where uh, the idea was actually have universities exist in communities where people volunteer their time to teach, to hold classes, to learn, and out of that engagement between community uh, residents and organizers who are trying to deal with real crises, that those crises and those conversations and their reading generate strategies, generate solutions. Um, even in, in p if you think about Ferguson, like the, the post-uprising, um, Hands Up United, some of these organizations were like, we're going to focus on technology training for young people um, on their own. You know, they're not even working through a university, but, but trying to develop ways to train and study in the question of, uh, of employment opportunities, which I think is a very pr amazing thing to do. But finally, to go back to the question of who does the research, I'm always struggling with this idea that somehow we have the superior research methods and that we have the research, that we do in the academy, we do the research, whether we're tenure track or adjunct or a research associate, whatever our, our status. But in fact, um, so much from, from um, uh, the National Welfare Rights Organization uh, or the Domestic Workers United, which I work with, you know, which is now a uh, national organization, they were doing their own research on the conditions of um, domestic workers, doing their interviews, collecting data, uh, uh, collecting um, uh, both empiric, uh, uh, statistical data as well as uh, stories, and gathering that stuff up together. And just all this valuable research that they're doing for their organization for the sake of pushing it forward, uh, which end up s ends up in the academy. So it, it flows this way in, instead of flowing the other way. Um, and it's those kinds of partnerships that, to me, represent the most, uh, I don't want to say 
generative, I was about to say lucrative, <laughs> but generative possibilities for advancing not just a research agenda, but making sure that whatever research is being conducted is being d conducted in partnership, collectively, for the benefit of advancing mm -hmm. an agenda, advancing a movement. Um, and I'll just give you one real quick anecdote. When Leith Mullings, uh, who's uh, you know a great anthropologist, uh, she was doing work in um, in Central Harlem uh, about just everyday life of, of, of people in, in in Harlem, and she created a community advisory board that would help her develop a research design. And so she was like a lot of anthropologists. She was focusing on ethnographies of people in Central Harlem, in their homes in their workplaces and stuff. And then the community advisory board said two things to her. They said, number one, your statistics are all wrong because you are, you're giving us numbers on unemployment. You need to give us numbers on employment. That is, you count the, the percentage of people who are actually working as opposed to those who are not working. And when you flip it, everything looks different. Because it means that you, have a, you don't have an unemployed community. You have a working class community where 70 or 80% of the population is actually working for a living. And it's not about de generating pride. It's about rethinking the, the power or character of a community. Right? And number two, they said, you keep coming to the neighborhoods and people's homes and streets. You need to go down to housing court. Because in housing court, that's where the black women are there fighting against their landlords, against the unfair conditions, fighting against evictions. The housing court is where they're gathering and need to see what they're doing. And suddenly, their agency, mm. as self-represented agents in the struggle against a system, totally changes the research design, right? That's, that's partnership. That's what I'm talking about. And, and that's not about sort of getting paid, but it's about really rethinking how we do our work. Go ahead and ask your question. That's a wonderful question. Let me add on to that. Okay. No, no, no. I, I, I want to add to that because I wanted to, to sort of give you the opportunity to come back to the multicultural student okay. government. One of the things, uh, your book, Freedom Dream, Dreams, um, there's a very simple argument at the core of that book, at least as I read it, which is that um, we have to be brave, brave and vulnerable enough to imagine the kind of world that, that we want to have and that's necessary. Right. And so as part of answering his question, um, the student's question, if you can sort of speak to that, that broader question of maybe the importance of, of dreaming. Right. And if you choose, that can be a moment where you can come back to this, this issue of the, of the right. MSG. Is that? Excellent. Okay. Ex excellent. Um, and this actually does speak to your question because um, there are many ways to try to, to change the university, many, many ways, more ways than there are, you know, ideas. Um, but there's sort of two thrusts. One thrust is to try to reform the existing structure. That is, you know what universities are supposed to do, you know what they're capable of, you know what the, and then you basically try to rearrange things so that it works a little better for those people who are left out. Um, that's one way of thinking about it. Another way, uh, and that's about belonging, and this is one of my, my criticisms uh, that I raised in this article, is about, you know, if you develop a politics that's strictly about trying to increase diversity by just simply having more bodies and creating spaces that are simply about, like, it be feeling like you're invited and part of a community, um, it may not necessarily transform them. In increasing bodies is actually not hard. Uh, increasing, uh, it's not that hard. In fact, you can increase the number of, of diver you could diversify the faculty. Um, but if it doesn't change the actual um, uh, project of what the university is doing, its relationship to, um, uh, to violence and war, its, its curriculum, 
um, it, 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 if it doesn't change, if, if you know, the, you, every year you still have the same racist parties and you still have the same, you know, um, uh, attacks on individuals, uh, if you have all this stuff, it's not going to change anything. You just have more and more people who create their own sort of unique spaces to survive. So transformation sometimes means, um, this goes back to the question of dreaming, being uh, what Fred Moten and Stefano Harney calls being in the university but not of it. That means you go here, you study, you do the work you need to do, you struggle, you protest, you make demands, but then you create alternative spaces within the university that can, that can model what you want the university to be. You teach yourself. The study group, you know, you give yourself a curriculum. You don't always have to demand that the university give you that curriculum, you make your own. Um, you have these conversations on a daily basis with each other. You begin to think about how you interact with one another in a way that's inviting as well as, as opposed to excluding. Um, you don't, in fact, we were talking about this last night, in fact, um, you don't mow mow people because they may not have the correct position on something. Because they may not, they may call you out of your, your proper gender pronoun. You don't start beating people up over that. You're like, well, let's talk about what that means. Those are not conversations you're going to have in the classroom for the most part, with some exceptions. But those are conversations that are necessary. And to bring people together, to say that, yes, there's some spaces that are going to be all black spaces, but there's some spaces that are going to be all like, you want to radicalize the university? This is going to be us. It doesn't matter who you are, where you're coming from, you're going to be in that conversation. And to model that is not, it's, it's in some ways to create uh, what might be like, what I talked about, dual power last night. And I know it seemed a little bit esoteric, but dual power has been the history of so many revolutionary movements. That is, you create this alternative space and you contest that space. Chiapas, right, you know, uh, is, w is an example of dual power in terms of a challenge to the Mexican state, right? Um, so this brings me back to the whole question of um, what I thought was a very interesting idea, the multicultural s student government, uh, which people keep saying is unprecedented. That's not true. It's not. Whoever writes that, they don't know what they're talking about. Um, the, the, it's th the multicultural student government is, I think, an attempt to resolve a failure of democracy. There would be no need for it had there been real democracy mm -hmm. at this university. So it's, it's a response to a failure. It's not just, no, no uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but students can come say, you know, what we really want is a separate student government. No, they, wa they wanted some representation, they wanted resources, they wanted to not get beat down. So creating multicultural student government is a, is a, is a form of dual power. It's sort of saying, look, um, you, since you're not going to democratize, and since the university is not going to stand up for us, we're going to create an institution that could oversee, that could look out for our interests, right? Um, and that has the potential of transforming a university. I think that's really important. Number two, we're also, we, we also have a very narrow understanding of democracy. Um, most of us don't even know the history of proportional representation. Mm -hmm. That the state of New, that New York actually had a system of proportional representation in, in the 40s, where if you came in second in the election, your party gets, if, you, if, if the Communist Party gets 30% of the votes, the Communist Party's on the city council. And they were in the city council. Socialists, all these different parties were able to get representation based on proportional representation. Multicultural student government is not proportional representation, but it operates on a similar principle that we, are, we exist as a minority because we've been excluded. Let's be honest. Um, the, the numbers are shrinking. And so therefore, just because we're a minority doesn't necessarily mean that we shouldn't have representation. Winner takes all, representative government based on that concept means that some people will be excluded. So the idea of trying to include those who may be a minority is so necessary for democracy because what it does is gives people a voice whose ideas may actually not be the most popular, but they may be the most generative. They may be the most important. And what it ends up happening is that the, the success of the multicultural student government will be able, I think, I predict, to be able to create programs and environments and opportunities that will reshape the university in ways that the standard student government has failed to do, right? 
and this is not blaming students, this is about recognizing that the university failed in its mission to create systems of representation for all students, right? So th I think that's one, one way to think about some of this stuff. Yeah. We have time for one last question or observation over here. Yeah. Well, we'll stick to our, 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 we'll do this. So Jonathan and then Sherry and then yeah. Yeah, uh, we'll close it out. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Robert. Uh, since, <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, since your talk last night, I've been, I've been turning um, Emmett Till over my head. Mm. I, I teach U.S. history. Uh, and um, the significance of that moment in the 50s for the right. movement and for the wider, wider country. Right. And so I was struck by your, um, first of all, your, your um, <clears throat> admitting that you no longer use the image of Emmett Till, which of course was so important to that moment, and then your explanation of why, that it came from pushback from students. Right. And uh, even more specifically, your sense from them that they felt tell me if I'm wrong, inundated with, with images of violence and that you didn't want to contribute, add more to their sense of their being inundated with images of violence. Right, in this particular generation, and, and I should just say that it's not, my position is not a permanent one. Does, in other words, this is an explanation that goes deeper, which we'll talk about. Yeah, so actually, I, I'm, I'm, that's exactly what I, I'd love for you to do. What images of violence were they, were they talking to you about that made you reconsider using something like Emmett Till's image and to what, it, I mean, are we talking about the culture, right. racist movies, I mean, uh, violent movies, um, either or? Um, what, let me, let me just stop there. And okay, you, that's good. Yeah. And so and Sherry, Sherry, yeah. <laughs> okay, um, Robin, one of the things I always have always loved about your work is the way that you connect um, music and the political imagination. <laughs> and I was wondering if you might want to comment on um, music artists um, and the current global movement? Oh, that's a hard question. <laughs> um, okay, let me, let me take the first, the first one and then I'll, I'll try to address the second one. Um, uh, what I didn't mention last night, which is probably very important, is that um, the only reason we know what Emma Till's body looked like was because his mother insisted on open casket. Okay, and those images were incredibly powerful, uh, not just in the United States, but globally, mm -hmm. because they were front page cover of Le Monde in France, of the, uh, the papers in the Arab world, the papers all throughout Europe and Asia. And in some respects, it generated a level of uh, commitment and empathy. It, 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 mar it, it, it did more to generate scorn for the United States and continuation of racism. And, and, and um, Emma Till's mother, um, Mamie Till Mobley, understood that. So in some respects, it kind of goes against what I said last night. That is, the, you know, because she had a choice. She's like, I want the world to see what they did to my son. And it totally changed the dynamics. It meant that many of the people who actually joined SNCC mm -hmm. were teenagers. Emma Till's age, and they joined because they saw those images. Um, I have a very funny story, which kind of ties to what Sherry's question. I'm going to come back to the last part. Um, and I teach a class called Jazz and the Political Imagination. This is my cheap way to get around asking, answering your question. Uh, and in that course, I was talking about like some of the avant-garde music in the 1960s, and I played in particular um, uh, Max Roach, uh, Freedom Now Suite. And in that, there's a, a song called Triptych, where Abby Lincoln, vocalist, is screaming. She's just screaming and screaming and screaming. It's very powerful. And I played it to my students after I told them. And then um, I had a lot of athletes in that class. This is at USC. So all the black men are athletes at USC, right? Um, and they're in the class, and they were just chuckling and laughing, and they're like, you know, that shit ain't music, you know? That's not music. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, so I said, well, well, tell me, what, how do you think, it, how, why do you think she screamed like that? What do you think it meant? And they just didn't get it. So I said, I'm gonna fix you. So the next <laughs> week, I show them the Emmett Till film. I show them that, and these guys were in the back crying. 
crying. And they came up to me afterwards like, you know, I, I, like I understand. Like I now understand what that meant. And that's about connecting the music in some ways to the trauma. Um, now, having said all that, um, my position is a temporary one. It's not a permanent one. It has to do with what we've been dealing with the last three years. And there has been, and you know, being on Twitter and stuff, there has been like a lot of pushback saying, I can't see these anymore. It's doing violence. And it never occurred to me, because I actually, I take, I'm a very hard professor in the sense that I think that hard things people have to confront all the time and that you can't run away from them, that they have this transformative effect, just like watching the Emmett Till film. But there comes a time of saturation. And I think there's something unique about the moment that we're in, in which the saturation is true. People say that thing about, no, they're inundated with violence all the time, violent films, violent you know, imagery. But the fact of the matter is that that's fantasy. You know, there's a difference between my son playing Destiny, which I hate that stuff, you know, but it's like, it's, for him, it's fantasy. The danger is that the lines between, are oh, you going around? Okay, thank you. Yeah, okay, I appreciate it. Um, the, the lines between fantasy and actual violence end up becoming um, uh, blurred in the drone room where people are dropping, uh, running machines, dropping bombs on people 10,000 miles away, right? So we're, we're in a time when I have to rethink representations of violence. I'm forced to do that. I gotta keep up with the times. And it means thinking more carefully about what to do as I eventually go back to people dealing with Emma Till's body. You know, because it's not, Emmett Till's body was extremely important for the transformation of the civil rights movement. And one thing I stopped saying and I didn't finish saying was that almost everyone who joined SNCC did so not to desegregate, but because of Emmett Till. 